industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. This video needs no big, big introduction, but this has been requested by my friend Jake and I told him that I was very happy to do this video. So without further delay, let me tell you the story of these incredible men. The Captains of the RMS Titanic The subject of the RMS Titanic and her story continues to be the subject of fascination, debate and speculation. Even today, following the recent incident of the submersible Titan, the Titanic is never absent from people's minds. But when it comes to the crew who had commanded her during the maiden voyage, a lot of people believe that Captain Edward John Smith was the Titanic's first and only captain to command her. This is not the case as the Titanic had been commanded by three captains during her lifetime. Coincidentally, all three captains were employees for the White Star Line and commanded the Titanic, Olympic and Britannic. While we aren't going into their full stories, we are going to be concentrating on their connections to the Titanic and where they were during the sinking on the 15th of April 1912. A captain who could smell ice, another who raced through the night to save passengers and crew, and the last who tragically perished in the disaster. These are the men who commanded the RMS Titanic. Captain Charles Bartlett Around the time of the disaster, Charles Alfred Bartlett was a White Star employee for eight years. He was familiar with the crew of the Titanic and was respected by those who worked alongside him. During his time with White Star, he was given the nickname Iceberg Charlie because of his ability to smell ice miles away. In January 1912, White Star appointed Barlett into the role of Marine Superintendent and in March, he captained the Titanic at the Harlander Wharf shipyard. He took in charge of where the ship towed from the deep water wharf and had its manoeuvring operations. In the following months, White Star had decided to appoint Bartlett on the next voyage from Southampton to New York after Captain Edward Smith's retirement. When the Titanic sank, Bartlett was residing in Waterloo when he received a telegram bringing the news. Bartlett was called to attend the British inquiry into the sinking. There, he was questioned by Lord Mersey and representatives of the White Star Line. During the inquiry, he was asked about the lifeboats, boat drills, the officers who were on board and the course the Titanic sailed on before she struck the iceberg. Following the inquiry, he was given the job of being in charge of the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea. He would go on to command the Britannic and would survive the sinking in November 1916. Captain Herbert James Haddock Captain Haddock had been with the White Star Line for 14 years and had experience at sea including the Royal Navy Reserve when he was made midshipman. 1912 was a busy year for Haddock, though it wasn't a smooth ride for him. After being captain of the RMS Oceanic for five years, Haddock, on the 25th of March, signed on as Titanic's master before travelling to Belfast. Although he was signed as a master, it was agreed that Haddock would become Titanic's captain and would be joined by Charles Lightoller and William Murdoch. However, the company made changes and it would be Captain Edward Smith who would command the Titanic as he was planning to retire after the maiden voyage. He was present at the Board of Trade's inspection of the ship on the same day and commanded her during her sea trials on the 2nd of April. 
He was released by Captain Smith once the Titanic arrived in Southampton. He switched back to the Olympic and as well as Charles Bartlett, it was rumoured that Haddock would take over Smith as captain after Smith retired. He was on board the Olympic when the Titanic struck an iceberg. When the Olympic's wireless operators told Haddock, he summoned the chief engineer to get the ship up to full power despite the Olympic being 505 miles away from the Titanic. While it was racing through the ice field, he instructed to try to continue contact with the Titanic. When the Titanic lost power, the Olympic got a wireless message asking if all of Titanic's passengers were safe. Haddock believed that this could be possible despite the false headlines. Later on, Haddock would go on to say, We steamed hard towards her for 14 hours before we picked up the Carpathia signals and knew there was nothing more we can do. When the truth was revealed, Haddock instructed to have a blackout until the Olympic arrived in Southampton on the 17th of April. Following the disaster, 284 firemen went on strike over the Olympic's new collapsible lifeboats. This left the Olympic struck off the Isle of Wight, which made Haddock furious. Although 100 non-union crew members were hastily hired from Southampton, Haddock had to signal a cruiser ship, the HMS Crocrane, to force the firemen to return to the ship. This was unsuccessful and they were arrested for mutiny. In May, Haddock was interviewed in person on board the Olympic by Senator William Smith during the American inquiry into the Titanic disaster. In the White Star berth, he and first wireless operator Ernest James Moore demonstrated how the wireless set worked and the Olympic reenacted the manoeuvres that the Titanic made before the iceberg collision. Haddock went on to command the Olympic during the First World War and was considered to command the HMS Britannic. However, he declined due to unavailability. So, Bartlett went on to captain the Britannic instead. He left White Star in 1916. Captain Edward John Smith the last and most famous captain who took command of the Titanic, Edward Smith had a long distinguished career with the White Star Line, but he didn't have the best record of keeping his ships incident free. One example is the collision between the naval cruiser, the HMS Hawk, and the Olympic, where he was criticised for his actions. However, Smith was never in charge of the Olympic, as he was following instructions from harbour pilot George Boer. Despite this, White Star promoted him to command the Titanic on her maiden voyage. While at sea, Smith received ice warnings from ships that were nearby the ice field, but he replied to them with thanks. However, one telegram from the Hydrographic Office was never delivered to the bridge. It was put forward to Cape Race, but why it happened is a mystery. Another mystery was the disappearance of a telegram from the SS Masaba, as it likely never reached the bridge. On the 14th, according to Charles Lightoller and Joseph Boxall, it was thought that Smith ordered to change the Titanic's course. However, both of their testimonies differ about Smith's actions, and this was later debunked. However, he did change the ship's speed to 21.6 knots before he went to dinner in the ship's a la carte restaurant this would lead to serious consequences. During the night, the Titanic made 78 revolutions on both her reciprocating engines in the night, converting to 22.5 knots. By taking these actions, the speed of the ship would have made the ship more manoeuvrable and would assure that the danger was faster behind the ship. 
About a minute after the collision, Smith asked Murdoch for confirmation if the watertight doors were closed. Afterwards, he ordered to swing out the lifeboats and made conversations with Ismay, the carpenter, and Thomas Andrews. The carpenter, Andrews, and Smith were reported to go down to the engine room. When they were on the bridge, Andrews, knowing the fate of the ship, told Smith that the Titanic wouldn't have long to live. It is unclear if Smith asked Andrews how long it would be before the Titanic reaches the bottom. But it is possible that Andrews's reply was, from an hour to an hour and a half. Smith found it hard to accept the situation, but he ordered the crew to continue preparing the lifeboats. Smith and the crew were kept busy throughout the night, but by 2.10am, the captain knew that there was nothing more he can do. He released the crew from their duty before he and Andrews met on the starboard side of the bridge. According to a testimony by Stuart Cecil Fitzpatrick, Smith said the following words to Andrews, We can't stay any longer. She's going. Trimmer James McGann, who was interviewed in numerous US newspaper articles, said that Smith tried to fight back the tears before he said, Well, boys, it's every man for himself before he jumped into the water while holding a little girl under one arm. McGann did the same, but Andrews jumped into the water by himself. A while later, Smith was reported to have swam to collapsible lifeboat B. He was offered a place to climb on the upturned lifeboat, but he refused. Captain Smith's body was never recovered. The careers of Bartlett, Haddock and Smith and their involvement with the Titanic show how experienced and prepared they were. With the mistake of the White Star Line promoting Smith to be the Titanic's captain, opportunities had been missed for Bartlett and Haddock. While Haddock could have taken quick actions to save the ship, Bartlett could have saved her thanks to his incredible ability to smell ice. Despite this, all three men led fascinating careers which played huge roles in the Titanic's life and death in the North Atlantic Ocean. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.